Hello and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. August 4th, 2023, the Defendant Knew They Were False edition. I'm David Kloss of CityCast. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm joined, of course, by John Dickerson of CBS Primetime, who's also in Washington, D.C., where he will be covering Donald Trump's arraignment. Hi. Good morning, David. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, America. Hello, Emily Bazelon. Hi, everybody. That's Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School. This week on the GabFest, the most consequential Trump indictment yet. What is it? Why is it important? Then Trump is also running away from the field, according to GOP primary polls, and is evenly evenly stacked up against President Biden for the general election. Is anything going to reshape the dynamics of this race? And then we will talk with New York Times columnist David French about country singer Jason Aldean's smash hit, Try That in a Small Town, and David French's piece about what small towns are really like. Plus, of course, we'll have cocktail chatter. Dispatch, this is Mindy at ME Flow. Coming to terms with a dying ACE unit is tough. I know because I've been there. I tried to get my old unit to last just one more summer, and boy, did I pay the price. Longest summer of my life. So trust me, if you need to replace your AC, just call ME Flow. My team is on time, total pros, and can take care of any type of AC replacement. Visit meflow.com to schedule your free estimate. ME Flow. One call, one company. Well, I gotta get back to it. Dispatch, this is Mindy, go ahead. The United States versus Donald J. Trump is the most popular title in years. It's being used over and over again. For the third time this year, prosecutors have indicted the former president. And this set of charges is the most consequential yet, accusing him of acting to subvert the Constitution and destroy American democracy by criminally trying to overturn the results of the 2020 election. I began this week thinking we would talk about last week's sort of upcharge on Trump involving his attempts to tamper with evidence in the classified documents case. Then later in the week, I thought, okay, we're going to talk about the imminent criminal charges in Georgia. But no, instead, we are talking about the charges from special counsel Jack Smith involving the 2020 election. So, Emily, just catch us up. What is Smith charging Trump with? Smith put out a 45-page indictment with four counts, and there are kind of three criminal schemes here. The first is that he's charged with conspiring to defraud the United States. Then the second is conspiring to obstruct an official proceeding. That's Congress certifying the election on January 6th. And the third is this old kind of Reconstruction era charge about people's rights. So basically conspiring to disenfranchise United States voters based on a statute that was originally passed to fight groups like the Ku Klux Klan who are preventing black people from voting. John, I think certainly for the first two charges involving the the conspiracy to the January 6th conspiracy and the the first conspiracy Emily described, there's a really important sentence in in Smith's indictment. These claims were false and the defendant knew they were false. So much of this case is going to depend apparently on whether prosecutors persuade a jury that Trump knew what he was doing was wrong, that he was making bogus claims and crazy claims. The defense is clearly going to say that it's going to be that he was free to say what he wanted about election, he had the First Amendment rights, to believe it and to misbelieve things. So what, in what you've seen so far, suggests that they can show his ugly mens rea, to use a phrase we had from last week? Well, and bad Emily, state I... of mind, just to translate that. Right. I think Emily's going to help me pick apart some of this because I think there are two things maybe in in the question you asked. Let me grab the free speech thing first, which is as the as the indictment says, basically right off the bat, you know, the, it's a prebuttal. Basically, the indictment says, look, the president had the right to say any damn thing he wanted and even to lie. All protected. Go for it. Well done, fella. He also had the right to challenge the election proceedings through the systems set up. What he didn't have the right to do is say stuff that wasn't true in the furtherance of a conspiracy, in the furtherance of committing frauds, a variety of frauds, uh, at the, and then they go through all the different ways in which he tried to engage in fraud, the fake elector scheme, the pressuring of local election official scheme, the Mike Pence on January 6th scheme. So you're allowed to speak freely 
but not when you're doing it for the, in the purposes of a crime, which to me, Emily, feels like a version of the yelling fire in a theater. You're allowed to yell fire in your bathtub, but you're not allowed to go into a theater and yell fire. So that seems like a dumb defense. Can you ratify that, Emily, before we go on to this other idea about what was in his actual head? Yeah. I mean, I think that one way to think about this indictment is it's telling this narrative arc from the election until the inauguration. And the story gets stronger of that Trump knew he was lying, right? And the kind of actions he's taking to try to overturn the election and stay in office ratchet up over time. So as you start and he's filing these lawsuits in the immediate aftermath of the election, you think like, okay, well, maybe he could have had a good faith belief that there were votes miscounted, et cetera. But then the indictment gives you all these examples of his advisors, people at the Justice Department, debunking specific claims he was making about, you know, 200,000 votes in this state or, you know, the votes that supposedly went missing in Georgia. And it doesn't matter that he's getting this information from the people around him because he's choosing to believe other people who are unnamed like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell and John Eastman, who are co-conspirators one, two, and three, is seems pretty obvious. So you sort of keep going. And then there's the fake elector scheme. And he's talking to the Justice Department about issuing a letter that would have, you know, helped further that scheme. And that's like an act he's doing. And people are continuing to tell him that this is not allowed. It doesn't matter that he has that information. And then one set of facts that really jumped out at me are these conversations he had with Mike Pence leading up to January 6th, right? So you have Pence, and this is clearly coming from him, and there's a reference to his contemporaneous notes recording that as he's saying to Trump, no, I don't have the power to delay or refuse to certify the election, that Trump says to him, you are too honest. And honest is a telling word there, right? Because it suggests that Trump thinks that it's a lie <laughs> to not be honest. And then the other thing is that on January 3rd, right in the middle as they're putting the squeeze on Pence, Trump has a meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff about some national security matter. And the Joint Chiefs say something to him about, like, don't, don't act on this because it's only 17 days till Inauguration Day. And at that point, Trump says, you're right, it's too late for us, let's leave that for the other guy. And I was just like, okay, like he really understood that he was not the next elected president of the United States in that moment. And no, you're I, not impressed by that. I don't, I'm not impressed not by in that the second one. one. Yeah. Why? Because you could just think, oh, I fought and I lost, like, and it's yeah. awful and it's unfair and it's a steal, but I'm not going to win in the next 17 days. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Exactly. Interesting. I mean, I take it as like it's a couple days before January 6th, and he knows that he didn't win at that point, and yet the events of January 6th are still about to unfold. No, you guys are not persuaded. I'm willing to be persuaded by lots of things. That one seems... That one doesn't seem as powerful. Seems more yeah. ten tenuous. I mean, if these are the best examples, though, Emily, I do think they're going to have a harder time making this case about his state of mind than than maybe Trump's detractors hope for. I mean, it is the harder part of the case. I guess part of this, though, is will the judge and jury, will the jury believe that if you're getting all of this truthful, factual information from everyone around you, if you refuse to believe it, even, I mean, I don't, I actually think those are pretty good examples that he knew. But if you want to think he refused to believe it, is that really a defense? Isn't this like a, what America is, that people are barraged with truthful, factual information all the time and they just choose not to believe it if they don't want to review their priors and change it? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's a defense for Trump, but I just am struck by how much truthful, factual information people are told all the time and then they continue to believe conspiratorial nonsense, which affirms the, their tribal position. Well, th th that's one of the ways in which this is not just about something that happened in the past. This is about the most live issues at the center of our democracy right now, which is whether anybody can agree on a common set of facts when those set of facts are bright, clear, and unassailable. The moon is not made of cheese, or the sky is blue when there are no clouds in it. If we can't agree on that, 
we have no basis for kind of going forward. And that matters because we're about to elect another president, which is based on the idea that a discerning public is able to look at a set of facts and come to a conclusion about who would best serve in the office. But if your ability to sort facts is so curdled, and this is an example of that, then how how are you going to be able to effectively participate in the democratic process? So that's why this is at the heart of, you know, in addition to the fact, of course, that this is an assault on the electoral system, which has been in pretty, in pretty good order with the exception of the Civil War, since the founders cooked it all up 236 years ago. And the reason elections come and go is that basically everybody's agreed that votes count and that we peacefully transfer power, which used to be the marvel of the of the world, but is now kind of was, at least until this period, kind of ho-hum. But now the question is whether it's ho-hum or not, whether there's a huge group of people in the country who believe that if it doesn't work out your way on election day, you can go around that system uh, if you just think you're right. One thing, the I think when you have a president who runs for office saying, I will not participate in any of the norms of the office, and please elect me to behave that way. And then you have a party full of people, and I'm struck by this. These are members of the president's party who seek to be leaders in the world and who speak at the drop of the hat about what they see as threats to the republic of the most infinitesimal size. In this instance, where there is a true threat to basically the pillar of democracy, can you have a free and fair election and a peaceful transfer of power? Doesn't get any bigger than that. That threat is ongoing and real. And they they are struck mute. So in a world in which the system that was originally designed relied on a couple of things, it relied on the virtue of the person in the office, and if that was not in in existence, a set of balances from all the other participants in the system. But the system did not work that way. There are only like one or two or three voices within the president's party that will even say, and we'll talk about this later with the campaign, will even say he did something wrong. And those who said he did something wrong in the smoldering moment of January 6th, many of them have kind of totally recounted it. I mean, Kevin McCarthy's a totally different person. Lindsey Graham, (laughs) totally different person. So in a world where that exists and the and the efforts to to hold a president accountable aren't aren't operating, then it seems to me you have to have a judicial system that takes care of this. Otherwise, people will think, you know what? You can get away with anything. We should hire our own person who can get away with anything and make them president. Yeah. No, it is. I'm I'm not the biggest fan of, of the American legal system and the, the self-importance of American lawyers and the American judiciary. But it does feel like in this case, this our relatively brittle, pretty politicized justice system is still what stands between us and the collapse of our political system. Well, but there's also the upcoming election, right? I mean, they could have argue, you could argue that that's the right place, that it's not the legal system, that it should be the political system. No, neither of you. I mean, it, it should be. It should be. But our political system is bonkers because of what David said, is that you can't agree on the fact that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, even when you've blinded everybody by making them look into the sun at the at the break of day. They, right. they will and the attribute legal... their blindness to, you know, I don't know, whatever's playing on the radio instead of the rising of the sun. Yeah. And the legal system has rules for fact finding and gathering evidence and presenting it. And I think that's actually incredibly important in this context. And um, which leads me to my next question, which is, do you think this trial could really happen before the election? I mean, you know, Jack Smith, I think, I think deliberately didn't indict the six unnamed co-conspirators to keep things simple and streamlined. If the trial does not happen before the next election, then, you know, if Trump wins, it's not going to happen at all. Presumably he'll uh, pick an attorney general who withdraw the charges. I don't know. I'm like... It, yeah, it just seems like timing is everything this, on this one. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it seems so complicated. You have the documents case, the Georgia case that's coming, the New York case. This case just seems like they can't all possibly happen before the election. Smith is going to have to prioritize. One last question. One, I would note, I'm in the jury pool for this case. I could be. All right. I'm a DC resident. I'm excited about that. I probably would get struck from the jury for all the terrible things I've said in the GabFest. But finally, John, do you think that strategically, if you are the Biden campaign or you're you're a Democrat running for Senate, 
how resoundingly should you be clamoring about this case and how essential it is to protect the future of the nation? How much should you talk about this? Not at all. Don't talk about it at all. Everybody else will be talking about how important it is to the nation. I mean, for two reasons, you don't want to do it. Let's go for the high-minded reason, which is this is serious. This is like, this is at the core of the system and let the system work. And the former president is entitled to a fair trial. And as Emily said, there are rules for putting forward evidence. Presumption of and, innocence. And the presumption of innocence is, exactly, is as much a part of the American system as all the things that Donald Trump tried to attack. Um, in the months leading up to January 6th and on that day. And so in behavior, one would want to model, and that includes us in the press too, one would want to model the standards that the former president successfully and constantly tried to erase. So that's the first thing. And then politically, you don't want to make it look political. You want to make it, especially when, when the best defense for Republicans is to say that this is all political. And then thirdly, if all that doesn't work and you get close to the election, you would just run ads with Kevin McCarthy, Mitch McConnell, Mike Pence, Lindsey Graham, and on and on and on, all the Republicans talking about what happened on January 6th and how the president, the former president, had a dereliction of duty and totally undermined the Constitution. I mean, th those, that all exists. And that's probably, uh, you know, that's a pretty fast way to remind people about what we're talking about here. This is not a parking ticket. I want to give a big thank you to our Slate Plus listeners. Because of you, dear Slate Plus listeners, we've been able to keep doing the GabFest for so long. Slate Plus members get great stuff for their subscription, bonus segments on every episode, special discounts on live shows, no hitting the paywall on the Slate site, a lot more. And this week for our Slate Plus segment, we're going to be talking about an amazing new study about American happiness. Who is happier, men or women, married people or unmarried people, young people or old people, rich people or poor people. It is an enthralling study. So if you're a member, again, thank you. Enjoy it. If you're not a member, go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member today. That's slate.com slash GabFest Plus. Slate listeners, are you ready to shape the future? Discover a one-of-a-kind opportunity with Schwartzman Scholars, a fully funded one-year master's program in global affairs. Hosted in Beijing, China, Schwartzman Scholars is an immersive experience designed to prepare the next generation of leaders to promote intercultural understanding and make an impact. The scholars dive into a cutting-edge curriculum focused on leadership and global affairs, immerse themselves in China's vibrant culture, gain unparalleled access to thought leaders, and learn from hands-on experiences around the country. The application is open now until September 19th. Head to schwartzmanscholars.org to learn more about Schwartzman Scholars Global Community. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by GiveWell. If you donate to charitable organizations, you probably wonder how much of an impact your donation can actually make because it is really hard to find information about whether a donation is doing good, let alone how much good it's doing. But if you're interested in making a meaningful difference for some of the poorest people in the world, check out GiveWell. They research evidence-backed, high-impact giving opportunities and share their work with everyone for free. GiveWell has spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only recommends a few of the highest impact opportunities they found. Over 100,000 donors, including me, have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. The evidence suggests that these donations, rigorous evidence, I would note, that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. You can find all of GiveWell's research and recommendations on their site for free, and you can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds and organizations, and GiveWell does not take a cut. So go to givewell.org to find out more or make a donation. If you make a donation, let them know you heard about them from us by choosing podcast and enter Political Gab Fest at checkout. Again, that's givewell.org. And now, on to the strangeness of our electoral politics, where despite the fact of the third indictment, Donald Trump remains in command of the GOP primary. He's running even with the incumbent president in a general election matchup, according to these early polls. So, John, this New York Times-Siena poll, I think that's what it was, this week really opened a lot of eyes to Trump's astonishing strength. What was in those numbers? What really struck you? What did it reveal? This one poll is one poll, but did catch a lot of attention. Well, you know, the normal things you would, the normal salt you would add to this is one poll is one poll, national polls, 
in a primary don't matter because the beauty of the system in both parties is that the voters get to examine the candidates up close and come to their own determinations about fine. But that's not, neither of those two things are in operation here. Those polls have consistently shown that Donald Trump has, as he claimed so long ago, a hold over a significant portion of his party whereby he could shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue and they would still support him. He has proved again and again and again that that has power, not just in the polls, but in the self uh, limiting behavior of all the people in his party who behave as if that were true in withdrawing and receding from any criticisms of him and of only saying things that are going to be popular with a group that believes things in that fashion. So uh, one poll affirms everything else we know about the system at hand. There are also no state level indications that that there's a different electorate out there than the national electorate. I mean, I guess the biggest surprising thing is that there has been, despite the mounting indictments, and again, the, the, all the news coming out of the documents case shows really dramatic cinematic efforts at obstruction. This is not obscure like the Manhattan District Attorney's case. This is easy stuff to believe. This is law and order. I mean, this is super simple. And uh, you have a situation where even in the New York Times poll, those, you had 22% of the people who believe that the former president committed serious crimes still want him to be president again. So it's, it's what we've said for a long time. It just affirms that. I think the, the, what may have gotten it so much notice is that Ron DeSantis, who has a perfectly good record on paper, a very successful governor of a big, important state, important electorally, but also the constituency there is a key one for the Republican Party. And he's doing extremely well in that state. And he is not only not doing well, he's dropping he is unsuccessful. And the extent that he's talked about things that Republican voters might like, all that seems to have done is to create an appetite in that Republican electorate for voting for DeSantis's opponent, Donald Trump. So, Emily, the, there was a really good analysis that the Times did of this poll data where they pointed out that about 37 percent in their poll of Republicans, this is the Republic, Republicans, identify as kind of hardcore MAGA Trump can do no wrong. You will never, ever peel them. There are another 38% who have mixed feelings, but would still support him and 25% who are adamantly opposed to him. So you would think like that means he only has 63%, but why is it that that 63% is not collectible around a single candidate? You mean, isn't collectible around another candidate? Another candidate. Yeah. I mean, I think because he has such a strong base in his MAGA supporters and then the people who have some reservations about him still told the Times that they saw him as the stronger leader and the more electable candidate. And those are really important attributes if you're trying to pick the person who's going to win and lead the country. And also of the 25 percent, you've got every other candidate running for the 25 percent. So that vote is split like crazy. And also the way to access most Republican voters is to first affirm everything about Donald Trump, then somehow make your case. But once you've done that, you've, all you've done is just give them all uh, reasons to keep staying, sticking behind the front runner. I mean, when you listen to the responses from Tim Scott and Ron DeSantis to this indictment, I seriously, it keeps coming back to me whether it's possible to say that that it may soon become an inaccurate description to describe them as challengers in a primary race. They are refusing to do what actual challengers in a primary race would do. What happens in a primary is that opponents take the smallest pretext, the tiniest little idea, and ram it right at the front runner. I mean, think about it. There was a whole several news cycles in 2012 when Mitt Romney was attacked for the fact that one of his advisors used the expression etch-a-sketch. And this was supposed to convey the idea that Romney was just going to wipe away his promises that he'd made in the primary once he got to the general election. That was several news cycles that, that his opponents made out of a child's toy. In this case, you have a former president who has broken with almost every possible part of his oath, and then who has successively ticked off all of the holding the opposite position of what the Republican Party used to stand for, either on personal morality or trade or deficit reduction or America's place in the world. And none of those things are brought up by his opponents. I mean, normally in primaries, like you will grab a tiny little plastic knife from the cafeteria and go at your opponent. And in this case, you have a wall 
of the newest grenade launchers and all the opponents are looking at it and saying, you know, I'd rather have a canopy. I mean, their response to this indictment, which could easily have been, you know, I'm worried about the weaponization of politics, but what the former president did is X, Y, and Z. They just never did the second half. But John, there are people who are doing that and they're going nowhere in the... Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson are running that campaign. Yes. Just, they are at what, one, two percent? I mean, Asa Hutchinson is, I'm not sure Asa Hutchinson has a vote. And that's why the one, that's why the people who are most talked about as challengers to former President Trump, DeSantis and Scott at the moment, are not doing that. Yeah, no, there's no point. But I guess my point is, if they're not doing that, they're no longer opponents or competitors. They are people who are engaging in a, in a, in a lot of travel to states. But I mean, they're not opponents. That's just not, they're not, they're not engaged in what we think we would think of as a normal competition. Um, and, and that may be a failure of theirs or a recognition that this is just a, a race that is over. Or the third thing could be that they have a deep wisdom that something, some other shoe will fall and somehow it will work on this race in a way that no previous ones have. Or number four, they don't really think they can win and then they're worried about retaliation afterward if they really go on the attack. Retaliation or torching their possibilities for the future. I mean, many people run for office to engage with the voters and learn about the thing and become popular and then, you know, run again some other day. And in, in that case, that's a really smart move but it doesn't make them challengers. They're no longer participating in a competition. I'm I'm sure you will now cite chapter and verse against me, John, but I cannot think of a single Republican office holder who's gone strong against Trump who remains viable, who remains, I mean, there are people like McCarthy who've condemned him, but then they've backed off of that condemnation. The only, yeah. I mean, Mitch McConnell is kind of the only one you can remotely make that case for. Yes, although then then you have to look at his standings in his own party. He is reviled in the Republican Party of Donald Trump. His his numbers are awful. He's the most effective majority leader politically, probably ever. Ever? How about yeah, ever? Probably <laughs> ever. Yeah, I mean you gotta you gotta think through Mansfield and 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 Johnson and I don't have the depth to do that. But I mean, he, politically speaking, I think you'd have to say ever. And I mean, specifically with respect to rewarding the beliefs of the party that he is in. For, I mean, for sure, incredibly effective and yet reviled. So uh, I think your your general point, David, is a very strong one. I mean, I'm just going to go back to the the original sin of the Republicans here is that in the immediate aftermath of January 6th, they did not all band together and throw this guy overboard. Like that was their chance. You have to join up collectively, hold hands to stand up to a bully. And they, some of them did it for like one second, including Kevin McCarthy. And then they all just like backtracked because they got scared. Before we leave this topic, I'm curious about the national uh, general election polling, which shows Biden and Trump uh, evenly split 43% each, I think. I just don't understand if 25% of Republicans are completely anti-Trump, why it is that Biden has not managed to open some kind of lead on the former president. Well, they can be anti-Trump in the primary and not be completely anti-Trump, right? I mean, that makes total sense to me that if you're a Republican and you're faced with a choice among Republicans, you choose someone else. But then once it's a race between a Republican and a Democrat, like your goals, your identity, your policy beliefs track toward Trump. And so then you pick Trump. Plus, there's that 14 percent of people who are not in the 43 versus 43 whose minds haven't been made up yet. And presumably some of them, maybe a lot of them are the Republicans you're talking about, David. Also, if they're going to hold their nose and vote for Joe Biden in the end, you have to get to the end for them to do it. Like, I mean, you, why make me eat this disgusting sandwich right now, even in answering it in a poll? Just there, it, it, Every time I think about the defenses being made of former President Trump with respect to this indictment or the previous one, I have two things in mind. One is, what does this tell us about his ability to participate in the office that he used to hold, right? And why should he be rewarded and given that power again? So look at all the behaviors he engaged in and then see if they're consistent with the ones you want for the office. And then you should think about like, what is the campaign message? So for example, if one of the defenses of the former president is that he really did believe that the election was stolen, essentially implicit in that, and again, this theory is that he really did believe it. 
Okay, then essentially you're saying that he was delusional, that in the face of a mountain of evidence, he was incapable of understanding and engaging with reason, which may be true for the purposes of defending him, but is not something you would want in a person who's given extraordinary power, right? So there is a way in which these, these defenses being made on his behalf to get him out of legal trouble are, should be, in a, in a traditional conception of the presidency, should be absolutely devastating for somebody running for president. Just on the polling, the, the general election polling, John, just to wrap this up, I mean, you, you're saying, well, if there are these people who are going to hold their nose and vote for Biden at the end, they, you have to get to the end. Does that mean that if you were a Biden advisor, that 43-43 seems OK to you? Well, no, I don't think it seems OK to you, although there is sign, there are signs in the poll that could make you, you know, uh, feel a little better at breakfast, which is that, I mean, Biden is 39 percent approval rating is bad. So let's not pretend that it's not. <laughs> that's but, not the good news at breakfast. Yeah, that's not the good news at breakfast. But the good news at breakfast is that his numbers on the economy are better. His numbers within his own party are better. People are, they're not still not good. Let's not pretend they are, but they are better than they were. Okay, so the approval rating is at a historically low level, but 39 is better than 33. 23% of registered voters think the party is on the right track. That's better than 13, who voted a year ago. <laughs> Right. So believe me, I am not saying these are good numbers to have, but you would rather have your numbers going in a positive direction than negative. The economy is is get is strong and getting better. And that will at some point uh, soak in. It's certainly soaking in within his own party where he has uh, tightened things up a, a pretty good amount. He's also got the benefit of his opponents. And that's, I guess, my final most important point, which is that at this point, a lot of polling is a referendum on the on the incumbent. But at the end of the day, it's a choice. And Biden has said this a long time, and it's a piece of wisdom that is true, but we always forget. But at the end of the day, it's a choice. And between now and the end, there is more downside potential for his opponent, likely to be President Trump, both in the specifics of President Trump's a, behavior, B, what comes out in court, C, what actually may happen in court, and then D, the responses of his party in response to this. I mean, there's a lot of crazy behavior you have to engage in to keep Trump out of the news or to drive around some of his behaviors. And that crazy behavior you engage in is itself potentially problematic for a party. So there's a lot of rustling and ferment and opportunities for Biden to benefit from the mistakes of his opponent. And so th those you know, things may help when, once it gets closer to actually the election for the incumbent. This episode of The Gap Fest is sponsored by GiveWell. If you're a donor, you might wonder how much of an impact your donation can actually make, because it's really hard to find information about whether a donation can do good, let alone how much good it can do. But if you are interested in making a meaningful difference for some of the poorest people in the world, check out GiveWell. They research evidence-backed, high-impact giving opportunities and share their work with everyone for free. GiveWell has spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only recommends a few of the highest-impact opportunities they found. And over 100,000 donors, including me, have used GiveWell to donate more than a billion dollars. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free, and you can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or organizations, and GiveWell doesn't take a cut. So go to givewell.org to find out more or make a donation. And if you do make a donation, let them know you heard about us by choosing podcast and enter political gab fest at checkout. Again, that's givewell.org. Dispatch, this is Mindy and E. Flo. You know, you don't have to put off fixing plumbing problems in your home anymore. I mean, you could just ignore that clogged drain or visit meflow.com to take care of your plumbing problems. M.E. Flow, license 271-001-2450. With the Planet Fitness Black Card, you don't just get a great workout, you get a great perk out because your membership is packed with perks. For $1 down and $24.99 a month, you'll get perks like access to any of our 2,400 clean and spacious locations. Bring your friend anytime and both work out with tons of equipment that'll give you that big fitness energy. Relax in the Black Card Spa and more. Work out and perk out with the PF Black Card. Join for just $1 down and $24.99 a month. Join the Judgment Free Zone today. Deal ends Thursday, August 10. See Home Club for details. The number one song in the country is Jason Aldean's 
Try That in a Small Town, a song that is either about small town values, wonderful small town values, or about vigilante justice, depending on who is listening to it. And it's gone to number one based on enormous conservative enthusiasm for the song, in part enthusiasm which followed a backlash to Aldine's song and video, a video that was filmed partly at the site of a Tennessee race riot and lynching. David French, the New York Times columnist, wrote an excellent column this week, Try Tolerance in a Small Town, that's a, a reply to it. And David is joining us. David is back on the GabFest. He's been here before. It's great to have you back, David. Hello. So I I would note, first of all, I'm a big country music fan, which means I have I listened to so many pie-ins to small town America. Yeah. It's just like enough. I mean, there's so many of them. There's so many of them. And actually, I was kind of surprised that it took this long for a song to incorporate racist dog whistles and vigilantism into it. I, there's so many of these songs you figured like someone had gotten, would have gotten to this earlier. But what in the controversy about Try That in a Small Town prompted you to write about small towns? Why did that come up for you? Yeah, it came up for me for a couple of reasons. One is I used to live in the exact small town where Jason Aldean filmed the video and was very familiar, not just with that. That's where my mom grew up. That's where my parents have a farm. That's where, gosh, our family's had a farm since before the Civil War. So I have a lot of history in that town. That's where we raised our kids. And so I knew the town very well. I also am a son of the small town South. So I was born in Opelika, Alabama, which is outside of Auburn. I was raised in Georgetown, Kentucky, which when I moved there had a population of around only around 10,000 or so. I think we had two stoplights in the town when I was growing up. And so this is the world that I knew, but it's also a world that I had changed my perspective on because... I had seen what it was like to kind of be the definition of sort of the insider, you know, like the small town my parents grew up in, my dad grew up in, they named the library after my grandmother, the small town, this Columbia, Tennessee, where Jason Aldean recorded the song. My mom's father was a beloved principal, you know, so this is, you kind of feel like you're, it's like your security blanket. And then things changed over the course of our lives. And I went from that sort of consummate insider to somewhat of an outsider in the town. And it gave me a really different perspective. And uh, and when I saw the Aldine song and how much it sort of glorified and idealized these small towns in the way that country music does, as you note, and then it added on that layer of it wasn't. I mean, this was explicit, <laughs> explicit calls for vigilante violence, not just against sort of criminals, but against people who say or do things that you don't like. And I just, you know, I got tired of all of the sort of geographic chauvinism <laughs> that is part of our culture war. So that's that's why I wrote my piece. I mean, I think there's also a really moving element in your piece about your own family and the kind of experience of adopting your daughter, right? And how that mm -hmm. made you realize that this kind of homage to small towns is about who's an insider and who's an outsider. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I mentioned that we started transition from insider to outsider, and it really started when we adopted our youngest kid, our, our youngest daughter, who is from Ethiopia. And all of a sudden, she had a an experiences that my older two kids who blonde, blue eyed, did not have at all. You know, the sensation of being followed through a store, the sensation of, you know, kids telling her things like she tries to get into a tractor, a trailer and a hayride at a, a farm not far from our house. And she's told she people with muddy faces aren't allowed that she is told by classmates that she can't come to our house because where, you know, you, you people live, it's not safe. And, you know, and you just had this kind of constant drumbeat that said to our youngest daughter, you're not one of us was sort of the real message that is broadcast. Now, our close friends were appalled about this. You know, they were appalled. They couldn't believe it. But we, what we saw was a side of our community that we hadn't seen before, quite frankly. And then when you laid the racial alienation on top of what then came next was political, 
because I was a Republican lawyer and, you know, life Reagan conservative and then opposed Donald Trump starting in 2016. And things really turned <laughs> and they turned in some really alarming ways. I mean, even to the extent that just in the, the interpersonal sphere, you would walk into, say, my one of my son's basketball games and a couple of families would literally turn their backs to us like in this very obvious way rather than even speak to us and so you had this sort of beginning it dawned on us that wait a minute something has really fundamentally changed and this place does not feel as welcoming as loving as it felt a few years ago. David, one of the things that st struck me about the song, and maybe getting too textual is uh, a mistake, but I'm gonna do it anyway, is that actually the geography of the, of the song is not about small towns. It's about the imaginings of, what it felt like to me was like a song that, it, that exemplifies negative partisanship, that essentially it is a, a song oh, yeah. of fantasies of things that are happening in the big city, and don't you try that here, which is so much, which is much more, much different than the small town songs that that, that David was talking about, or even John Mellencamp's um, small town, which is like right. here are these beautiful things that grow out of this geographical space. This is don't. This is all about somewhere else, actually, physically. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. And that's what I talked about the concept of sort of geographic chauvinism. In other words, you people over there. Do not mess up what the, this really good thing that we have here, right? And so, you know, all of those maladies that he's talking about, he's not, you know, not so subtly implying don't exist where he is. And the fact of the matter is, I mean, come on, you know, they're, they're some of the most dangerous places in all of America are rural counties, especially when you, when you talk about co the combination of violence and deaths of despair. Uh, and things like industrial or car accidents and things like that. When you add it all together, some of the most dangerous counties in America are actually quite small rural places. There are a, tremendous maladies that afflict small towns, just as there are maladies that afflict big cities. There is no utopia in the United States of America. And this sort of geographic chauvinism that says, oh, yeah, my, my spot, my place is sort of this pure untouched place from, you know, compared to the maladies elsewhere. You know, that was another purpose of the piece. I didn't really dive into all the, the you know, the dangers that actually do exist in some of these really struggling rural communities. But I wanted to show that, look, these places have problems as well. And, and really the measure of a place isn't how much it embraces the insiders. The measure of a place is really how open is it to the outsiders. To shift gears slightly, uh, this is not the only successful bit of conservative culture recently. You have Sound of Freedom, which is a movie about an American fighting child sex trafficking, making huge box office numbers, driven by word of mouth conservative enthusiasm, largely. And the top three songs, in fact, in the country are country songs right now, which has never happened before, including one by Morgan Wallen, who's also a, I think, got strong conservative associations. Conservative culture traditionally has had this sense that it, it was an outsider or traditionally in the last 30 years like it that it hasn't been able to to break out nationally but now i think there is this way in which it is and we're seeing evidence of it do you have do you have any sense about why it is that that these bits of conservative culture are having such success nationally now yeah, that that's a really good question. I mean, I think in my in my lifetime, country has always waxed and waned. Uh, we've been through many moments where country music is suddenly a lot more popular, or seemed to be a lot more popular than it was a few years ago. So, country always is kind of hovering out there. <laughs> I remember, you know, in the early days of Taylor Swift, she was a country artist, and you know, in in many ways, when you're seeing the extraordinary success of the Taylor Swift tour, part of that is the legacy of her country days as well. And so I think country has always waxed and waned. And I also think in an interesting way, the right, the cultural right has always underestimated its own power and influence. And so for me, I don't, I live very much in red America. I don't really sense a huge 
unique cultural moment because I feel like we've been through a number of these before. I mean, Sound of Freedom had its echoes many years ago when The Passion of the Christ came out and did what three times as much business as Sound of Freedom is doing. There was there have been many moments in the in the relatively recent past where Christian music songs suddenly started to hit the charts and and country music songs would hit the charts. And so I've kind of always had this thesis that the demise of conservative culture has always been somewhat exaggerated and that this sort of sense that a lot of people have in these small towns or wherever that all of culture is dominated by the other side is is quite frankly exaggerated and has always been somewhat exaggerated. And so um, I don't experience this as a uniquely different moment. It's just sort of one of those ebbs and flows that we see and have seen, you know, in the last 25, 30 years. So, David, don't you think it needs that? In other words, it's an important marketing aspect of the work to say, not just here's the art, but the, here's the art and it's being oppressed. <laughs> oh, it's a tried and true way to magnify your reach. I mean, there's just no question about it. And and also, you know, elite scorn is a way to magnify your reach. And so all of this is sort of, there's kind of a way in which a lot of these controversies, both sides kind of need each other. In other words, the Aldine song, but for the backlash, wouldn't be number one. He needed that backlash. Otherwise, it just gets lost in the noise. And then at the same time, there's also... A lot of people who look at that and say, yep, see, that's what they're like. And it, and so you kind of have this back and forth. You know what it reminds me of in a, in a weird way is when I was growing up, there was the, there's always been various periodic sort of panics over music. And I've sort of, you, you get the pattern recognition when you, you spend enough time with it. And I remember just pure panic over things like heavy metal and the satanic influences of heavy metal. And then you have, when you get older, you realize, oh, everybody involved in this fight had something to gain from having this fight. And that's what happens with a lot of these pop culture moments like this. But I would say one of the differences, John, is right now this is overlaid on top of a country that is actually kind of a tinderbox. And so what we have is sort of one of these rote standards uh, pop culture blowups that we've seen for 30, 40 years, but everything feels more fragile now because everything is more fragile now. Whereas you could roll your eyes before at the assertions that songs will cause violence. Now you kind of start to wonder in the aftermath of a lot of political violence in this country that we've seen, wait a minute, are we pouring a little bit of you know, are we pouring a little bit of gasoline here? Uh, wh wh what's going on? And so I think that what you have is standard pop culture blow up in a non-standard time, if that if that makes sense. Yeah. And I wonder if uh, Aldine's just going to have to always play this song. It reminds me of what John Prine used to tell young songwriters, be careful what, what you write because it might be a hit. And then you'll have to sing it for the whole rest of your life. And I don't know, I could see a way in which for a certain kind of artist, this would be an albatross over time because it has taken on such cultural resonance and therefore gets appropriated and everybody runs with it. And it's so much distant from whoever you are. And yet you still have to full, fill it full of passion when you sing it. I feel um, like you're imagining a different Jason Aldean. Yeah, he's he's not, it's not so anymore. different. It's not so different from who Jason Aldean is. That's fine. I mean, That's it just fine. seems but like I he's definitely... played this so cynically and well yeah. to make a lot of money. But I guess I'm just wondering if in 20 years he's still going to be like, yep, got to run out there and, and do this. I don't know. We'll see. Well, you know, one of the things that's so rich about it is you just got to love the big bro vigilante country album followed immediately by the victim posture. Yeah. But, you know, look, that's that is that is the paradigm for gaining audience and traction right now and sort of this grievance-focused right-wing infotainment universe is I'm really totally the toughest guy in the room and completely a victim. <laughs> and so this is constantly the dynamic that you see. David, you wrote a piece this week called The Trial America Needs. We were just talking, of course, about the new indictment against Donald Trump 
And I was being somewhat nervous, like a nervous Nelly about the idea of the legal system as opposed to the political system trying to hold Trump accountable. You are making a really strong argument that this is, like you said, exactly what America needs. And one of the things you say here is that if a prosecutor believes, as Jack Smith appears to, that Trump has done all these things, it would be a travesty not to file charges. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So essentially what you're dealing with here are four statutes where the intent intent really matters, right? So some some criminal laws or some some laws, they're not really matters of intent. So if you're speeding, for example, and the cop pulls you over and you say, I didn't know I was going 60 in a 40 zone. Well, that doesn't matter. You're still getting the ticket. But in some in some circumstances, criminal intent really, in many circumstances, criminal intent really matters. And here is one of those circumstances. And so in if you are a prosecutor, as Jack Smith is, and you have these statutes, especially in my view, the one that was the surprise to an awful lot of people, 18 U.S.C. Section 241, Conspiracy Against Rights, which is this Klan era, Reconstruction era statute designed specifically to protect voting rights as one of the rights. Well, if you believe that you have that proof of intent, that he did intend to violate these rights, that he did intend to defraud, to use deceit to interfere with the operations of government, then this is exactly a case you would bring against anybody else. It wouldn't be controversial brought against anybody else. Now, that doesn't mean it's a, as I said in the piece, it's not a slam dunk because intent centered cases are often difficult cases, but you have these statutes out there. The actual actions that Trump undertook are plain from the record. So that part of it is not nearly as difficult. And then if you believe you have the evidence of intent, the only reason you wouldn't bring this case is because it's a former president of the United States. And I don't think that that should be the factor. And so, yeah, I think this is a necessary case to bring under the facts as we understand it. But that is absolutely not the same thing as saying it's an easy case. It's a slam dunk of a case, but I think it's a necessary case. David French is a columnist for the New York Times, and he is firing on all cylinders these days. You should absolutely read him. <laughs> David, thanks for coming back on the GapFest. Thanks for having me. Let's go to cocktail chatter. When you are sitting in a small town, Emily, having a cozy little glass of something, small town companion, what are you going to be chattering about? I went down an extremely pleasant and lovely rabbit hole this week of reading all the stories I could find by the French, I think French American, but French writer Camille Bordas. I started with this recent story in the New Yorker, Caloran, Colorado. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. And I just really liked listening to her read that story on the New Yorker fiction podcast. And then I just like found a whole bunch of other stories she'd written. And some of them I could listen to the audio and some of them I just read them. And I don't know, there was just something so appealing about Bordas. I didn't know her work before. She is also the author of a novel, How to Behave in a Crowd, which I ordered. So I can't vouch for that one yet. But if you're just a short story fan, there's something very appealing about the voices she chooses. Often they're young people, kind of wryly, but also poignantly observing their worlds. So that's my chatter this week. The French, I think, writer Camille Bordas. John, do you have a chatter? I have my, well, my chatter is about the saga of Voyager 2. NASA recently announced that the Voyager craft, Voyager 2, which I believe is 12 billion miles away from the Earth, Voyager 1, I believe, is 18 billion. Somebody can write in and let me know. But anyway, real far away from the Earth, these commands were sent. And who among us, by the way, has not in life sent an email that they wanted to pull back? Well, they sent these commands to the Voyager 2, and the commands caused the antenna of the Voyager to turn by two degrees, thus cutting off all communication with Earth. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Womp, womp, womp. So that was a big bummer for them. But the news is good. They apparently, subsequent to this disconnect with Voyager, which is, you know, our farthest flung, I guess Voyager 1 is, but Voyager 2 is close on its heels, or uh, V'ger, for those of you who are Star Trek fans. Uh, yeah. It's our farthest flung soundings from what's happening out there in the cosmos. But they detected a faint heartbeat. 
Uh, and apparently there is a chance that they might c- connect again. And if it, that doesn't work in the more short term, apparently, apparently in October, there is like a system upgrade that's coming. And that once they do that, you know, it's like if you're on a PC machine and you power down and it says, please wait four minutes while we update your system. Essentially, when that happens, as I understand it with Voyager 2, there's a chance they can be back in touch. And this is quite important because, you know, there there are uh, there are life forms out there that are anxious to get in touch with us. My second chatter is log rolling, which is I did an interview with the writer Dan Pink, who has written uh, books about everything from the Free Agent Nation, which is his first really big one, which was many years ago about people essentially taking their livelihoods into their own hands, which now we talk about all the time in the context of the pandemic. But he's talked, he's also written about the scientific power of timing or the science behind perfect timing. And his most recent book is a book on regret. And I interviewed him about that. But more to the point, I also talked to him about creativity and writing, the craft of writing, the business of writing, and sort of idea generation. And we turned it into a shorter than half hour special that appeared on our streaming network. So if you go on YouTube and just search for Dan Pink and John Dickerson, there is a, I think, lovely interview that we did of uh, 22 minutes about all of those things. I, mostly when I go on YouTube, I search for Dan Pink and John Dickerson. That's my number one search term. Now I'll finally, I'll finally get something in it. <laughs> my chatter, uh, I'll start with the log rolling and finish with the chatter. The log rolling is, as GAFS listeners know, I offer a tour of Fort Derussi, which is this wonderful secret Civil War fort hidden deep in Rock Creek Park. It has an amazing history. It has five stars in Airbnb, this tour. And uh, I just opened a bunch of new dates in the fall and winter. So if you have wanted to go on this tour, but have not been able to get a ticket, if you go to Airbnb, look for exploring a secret fort. And I have dates on Saturdays and Sundays in the fall. That's the log rolling. The chatter is about this discovery of an amazing whale. They've discovered the strangest whale they've ever discovered. Paleontologists have found the bones of this creature that lived 39 million years ago which they believe weighed as much as the blue whale, which is the heaviest animal that's ever existed. And so it's a 200 ton whale, but it is so mushy and lumpy and floppy and unattractive. It is just the opposite of your typical whale. It's apparently it's much more like a manatee. It just, it's just like sort of floated around in shallow waters eating, you know, so it's the, the phrase is sausage like body with a paddle shaped tail. And yet it was 200 tons in size. And it's called the Perucetus, I guess the whale of Peru, I suppose that's what that must mean. But it's just cute that they've now discovered this, maybe the largest animal that's ever existed or the second largest animal that's ever existed. And it was a, a lump of sausage. So I was charmed by that. Listeners, you also have sent us chatters. Please keep them coming. Email them to us at gabfest at slate.com. And our listener chatter this week comes from Alex Callahan. Hi, Gabfest. This is Alex Callahan from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. My chatter is called We'll Never Be That Drunk Again in Maze Under Magazine by Peter Brawl. And it's a story that I thought was particularly appropriate for cocktail chatter because it's about how much people used to drink a hundred and some odd years ago. And the story begins with expert testimony in a New York court where Philip Koch tells a judge that drinking a mere 30 quarts of lager, and that's 28 liters for the rest of us, left him comfy and that he was not remotely drunk. And the judge says, well, maybe that makes sense because most people would drink around seven to eight pints per person per day. Something that I thought John might find particularly interesting, and this wasn't Peter's original reporting, was James Madison drinking about a pint of whiskey a day and John Adams, who would start drinking at breakfast. Peter goes on to talk about some of the not-so-storied Canadian history and suggests that perhaps if we're trying to make sense of some of our politics today, the early histories of our governments, that we might just have to look back through beer goggles, through beer goggles. That's our show for today. The Gab Fest was produced today by Jared Downing. Our researcher is Julie Hugan. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants. Ben Richmond is Senior Director for Podcast Operations. Ben did me a solid this week, got me some data I was looking for. Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Audio of Slate. Please follow us on Twitter at, at SlateGabFest. Tweet chatter to us there, or better yet, email it to us at gabfest at slate.com. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. Thanks for listening. We will talk to you next week.
Hello, Slate Plus. How are you? Are you happy? How happy are you? If you are married, I suspect you are probably happy. If you have a college education, you're probably a little happier than somebody who doesn't have a college education is listening. There's an amazing paper published this week, The Sociopolitical Demography of Happiness by University of Chicago Emeritus Professor Sam Peltzman. And it looks at data from the General Social Survey, which has asked a sample of adults for 52 years already, 51 years already, are you very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? And Peltzman got looked at 50 years worth of data to see what does the data tell us about what kind of people are happy and what kind of people are less happy. And he looked at age, race, gender, education, marital status, income, geography, political beliefs, and it's freaking fascinating. Emily, what stood out to you in this and what do you want to talk about from it? Well, here's one thing that surprised me, and maybe this is going to sound kind of dumb and naive, but he finds basically that the wealthier you are, the happier you are, or the more likely you are to say that you're happy. And I was actually surprised by that. I had this idea that there's- That was just a snippet from our Slate Plus conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation, go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member today. Dispatch, this is Mindy and E. Flo. Well, boy, it's getting hot out there, and I can't imagine surviving summer without AC. Now, if your AC is making funny noises, just needs a once over, or your home isn't as cool as it used to be, call ME Flow. My team is on time, total pros, and can take care of any type of AC repair. Visit MEFlow.com to get your AC back in tip top shape. ME Flow. One call, one company. Well, I gotta get back to it. Dispatch, this is Mindy. Go ahead.